nice to be here with you this morning. It's also um, always nice to follow Matt because usually there's not much else to uh, have to say. Um, Matt, Matt really, I mean, when you're talking about uh, trends in, in R&D and, and specifically the federal budget, Matt's got it all down. So, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of uh, take, uh, take a little tangent here, and since we're in Washington, or at least the, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., talk a little bit about the uh, political and advocacy process for FY16 as it pertains to, uh, to research spending. So, um, so Matt, Matt ended um, on, a, on a high note, um, relatively, and I just want to emphasize that point. So things are, things are pretty bleak for, um, uh, for science spending, federal science uh, funding. Um, we're looking at basically flat and declining budgets over, um, over the past several years. But when you compare, especially, especially under inflation, but when you compare that to the growth of the discretionary budget, we're doing really well. So the discretionary budget grew last year by, I think, 0.1%. Um, and uh, and the, funding, the, the funding for science agencies was considerably higher than that. Um, so it's all, it's all relative. Uh, this year, the, uh, the discretionary budget grows, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe two-tenths of a percent. Um, and so we're hoping to, uh, to beat that as well. Um, and, um, and, and what we'd really like to do, what we really need to do is grow that part of the pie that, um, that is available for discretionary spending. Um, uh, as in Matt's charts you saw, that's, it's, it's coming, coming down to being only about a quarter of all, um, all federal spending um, anymore annually. Uh, the rest of it is, is sort of set out. We, we, don't, we don't tinker with it, we don't mess with it. Um, and, um, and, and our universities uh, have of late, say the past three or so years, um, actually made the case through uh, letters that, that presidents at our universities have written uh, to President Obama and the Congress, have said, you should tinker with the rest of that part of the budget. We should consider entitlement reform, reforms to the mandatory part of the budget, that can that can create some savings and also reforms to the um, uh, to the to the tax code that can that can yield some uh, additional revenues so that we can we can release and and free up some uh, some additional resources for the discretionary part of the budget which is where all the investment spending takes place right so investment spending research education infrastructure. All that happens in the discretionary part of the budget. And if we just continue to shrink that, you can, you can you know, bet darn well that we're gonna ultimately shrink our economy going, going, down, going down the pipe. So uh, our, our case is that you've got, to, you've got to increase the discretionary part of the budget so that you can increase your investments um, and ultimately grow, uh, grow the economy. So, um, so part of what, what we're, we're looking to do in this short term is provide some relief to the discretionary part of the budget above the sequestration caps. Um, and uh, Matt alluded uh, to this also in his talk. Um, there, there are discretionary caps, so, so Matt showed you the chart of the, of the, of the cuts that the Budget Control Act made, so that, that was already down from, you know, budget up here, down to here. Sequestration is down even further. What we'd like to do is provide, help, help Congress and the President provide some relief somewhere in between. We're not gonna get over the Budget Control Act caps, which are already tight. Um, but, uh, but included in that, dis in that um, sequestration level caps, are, are two subcaps. One is for discretionary, um, non-defense discretionary spending, and the other is for defense discretionary spending. 
And, um, and part of the Budget Control Act um, outlined that those two should be kept in parity. The cuts to the discretionary part of the budget and the cuts to the non-discretionary part of the budget should be equal. And, and the thinking there is that um, you won't steal from non-defense to give to defense. So the president has been very clear that he intends to retain that parity, although some in Congress are more interested in increasing the caps on the defense side, perhaps at the expense of non-defense, or increasing the caps on the defense side and just not worrying about non-defense. Our, um, our, our sort of stop point there is the president. He won't sign a bill that does either of those two things. Um, and we need a bill passed to change the law now of sequestration. So, so that parity principle is one that, that um, we're relying on and one that we continue to advocate to Congress on. Since there's a lot of, congress of congressional interest, or well, maybe not a lot, at this point some congressional interest in increasing the defense discretionary caps, um, we are hoping that that will translate into increasing the non-defense discretionary caps as well. So we're, we're making the case for that. We're working with um, some folks who have already come out um, in support of providing some relief to the discretionary side of the budget. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we're, you know, we're working to get somewhere in between that sequestration and that, that budget control. That's a, that's $100 billion a year, right? So that difference, $100 billion a year, can do a lot. Um, particularly in the s and world with a, with a hundred billion dollars. So, um, so we go through an annual exercise of looking at the president's budget, looking at what Congress appropriated last year, and coming up with a advocacy request for the, uh, the next fiscal year. So for FY16, we look at what Congress appropriated for FY15, we look at the president's budget request, and we make a determination working with our campuses, working with the broader science uh, and, um, and research community, which includes folks from industry, scientific society, patient advocacy groups, um, and, and we come up with requests. What are our advocacy requests for, um, for the, this next fiscal year? Sometimes the high point is the president's budget request. As for instance, for, um, for the National Science Foundation, the president requested an increase of 5.2%. Um, that's that's probably, probably the highest we'll get from Congress. So we'll go with the president's budget request for, um, for NSF. For NIH, the president's request was, was a little lower. It was about 3%. And, um, and for NIH, the, the NIH community um, would like to see closer to that 5.5%. That so for NIH, we're asking for above the president's budget request. Um, those, are, those are just a couple of examples. And, and these, these um, advocacy requests that, that generally we'd like to um, have be common among all in the advocacy community. Um, they, they, they come about through some wrangling, some, um, uh, uh, some debate, oftentimes not with a whole lot of um, clear, um, uh, uh, common purpose. So NSF, 5.2%, um, NIH, Increase of about five and a half percent. Afri in the in the the, the um, Agriculture Food and Research Initiative in USDA. Well, the president requested about a thirty eight percent increase there. We're going to go with that. We we we'd like to see that number um, for, um, uh, for except for defense, where where there's actually been a lot of thought about what the percent should be of, um, of S&T out of the, the, the broader 
um, research, uh, research, development, technology, and, and um, exploration account. What the S and T account should be. So that's the basic through um, uh, through applied research accounts. The the the, the there's a, a twenty percent principle that of the whole RDTME budget for defense, 20% should be for S&T, and 20% of the S&T should be for the basic research, the 6-1 research. Um, and that came out of a, I believe, a decadal report for, um, for defense a few years back, it has been endorsed by, um, by the secretaries of defense since then, um, and, um, and is something that uh, really gives the community um, something to point to when we say, you know, that's why we're asking for, for this level of funding. The other science agencies have sort of broader, uh, broader reports on the importance of, of research to our country. There was a recent report that, um, uh, that the American Academy for Arts and Sciences, the, the other uh, AAAS, as we call it, um, uh, recently came out with, this was a report that was um, co-authored by Neil Lane, former OSTP and, and NSF director, um, and Norm Marietstein, formerly CEO of Lockheed Martin, and, and many others. And, and this report suggested that 4% over inflation should be the growth rate for, um, for S&T steady, not, nothing that, that's too dramatic, um, uh, and something that, that can be counted on. So the, uh, I'll give you an example of too dramatic of an increase, um, perhaps, and this, is, uh, this might be a little controversial, but the NIH doubling, that happened in five years. There were increases of 13% a year, over those five years, that was great. Boy, the, the biomedical research community just loved it. And then as soon as doubling was over, as soon as that five-year period was over, boom, down. And now, now, we're, now we've got an NIH that has purchasing power of over 20% less than it did 12 years ago. So, so you know, Congress basically said, okay, we doubled your check. We don't need to worry about NIH now for a while. And, and while there are many, many, I think at least over half, members of Congress weren't here for the doubling, um, those who were continue to say, oh, NIH had its day. We're, we're fine with NIH. So, so we don't want to see anything too crazy, anything, um, anything too, um, uh, too sharp of inclines that cannot be sustained. We want to see those steady, sustainable, and, and predictable uh, growth patterns in science. Um, quite unlikely that that will happen on a, on a very practical level. Um, Congress people are elected for, uh, on the House side for two years at a time, and that's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about their, you know, their next election. Um, something like steady support for science doesn't really, unfortunately, buy them too many votes. Um, but we're trying to make the case that as, um, as basically the stewards of, um, of our federal research dollars, that, that science and research ought to be prioritized. Um, so let's see. Oh, one, one other um, uh, note is uh, that recently, just over the, the past year or so, We've seen, we've seen some bills, mostly focused on NIH, but we've seen some bills, and, and we're gonna see a new one come out on Monday, that figures out a different path for increasing funding for, um, for science accounts. So um, uh, last year, Senator um, Durbin uh, introduced a um, America Cures Act, and, and that act set up a separate trust fund. It basically, busted the budget, set up a trust fund um, uh, that would uh, be used only for NIH, FDA, uh, DOD, um, uh, health research, um, and CDC. Um, Senator Herkin introduced a, a bill that would increase the sequestration caps only for additional funding, so only for increases 
at NIH. And, and Senator Durbin is going to be introducing a bill on Monday, I believe, or announcing a bill on Monday, that would provide those same increases to the sequestration caps for several science agencies, including NSF, uh, Department of Energy, Office of Science, uh, Department of Defense, s and 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 some other places. And so there's there's interest in Congress, and in you know mostly these bills are are um, sponsored and supported by the minority, so the Democrats in in the House and the Senate currently. Um, but but there is some uh, interest from uh, from very pro science Republicans to to consider these um, these tools. So there's there's a possibility here of if not increasing the discretionary caps overall, then finding the, the right place to increase the, the sequestration caps, and that's for the investment in, in science. So trying to end on a, on a high note, as, as Matt did, there's some hope here. Um, uh, we, we continue to work hard. I will say APLU is um, all the big public universities across the country, all the land grants, so we're We've got um, representation in every state, which definitely helps when we're trying to get attention um, uh, from Congress, um, and, um, or the attention of Congress. Um, and, uh, and we work closely with the government relations folks at all, at all, our, um, uh, at all our campuses and, and work with them to, um, uh, to advocate the, um, uh, our, our, our priorities for every fiscal year. We, we put out these one-pagers for every appropriations bill that includes programs um, and agencies of interest to us um, and share that with your government relations folks. And so um, uh, you're, you're also welcome to, um, uh, to use these materials if they can be of help to you. I, I, I presume that you'll have some time uh, for advocacy while you're here in, in Washington. Um, so check out our website and, um, and, and our FY16 uh, funding priorities if, uh, if those materials can be of help to you. Thanks.